Hello and welcome to the CPE webinar, Enhance Your Advisory Role, Discover the Risks and the Rewards of Using Rollovers as Business Startups. My name is Jeff Kuzmik in Paychex Marketing, and it's my pleasure to host this webinar. We are happy to partner with Guidant Financial to provide this webinar topic to you. Today, one of the fastest growing segments in franchise and business funding is Rollovers as Business Startups or ROBS. We believe that you, the accountant, tax professional, are in a unique position to add tremendous value to respond to inquiries from your clients regarding the operational requirements of ROBS. So our goal today is to give you the knowledge that you need to provide proactive advisory ideas pertaining to these arrangements. And we believe with this knowledge that you can provide significant client value. We are thrilled to have three subject matter experts deliver the content for today's session. And at this time, I would like to introduce them to you. David Nilsson is the CEO of Guidance Financial, which he co-founded in 2003. To date, he and his 110 employees have helped 15,000 entrepreneurs from all 50 states to secure $4 billion to start or buy a business. In 2016 alone, they helped American entrepreneurs secure $400 million. Approximately 75% of their customers have utilized rollovers as business startup arrangements. Guidant Financial has been named to the Inc. 500, 5,000 list six times and is a five-time Best Places to Work honoree. Nilsson was recognized by the SBA as the National Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 2007. Brian McManus, partner in the tax department of Latham & Watkins, focuses his practice on civil and criminal tax litigation. He has successfully litigated complex tax cases in the U.S. Tax Court, the Court of Federal Claims, and several federal, district, and state courts. He represents taxpayers in IRS audits, administrative claims, IRS protests, and post-appeals mediations. He advises clients regarding Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, Compliance and Enforcement, Bank Secrecy Act, Examinations, Information Reporting, Employment Tax and Executive Compensation, Workers' Classification, and Retirement and Pension Plans. Brian is recognized as a noted practitioner by Chambers USA 2016 and is also recommended by the Legal 500 U.S. 2014 through 16. Tom Smith graduated in 2002 from the University of Washington School of Law and is a member of the Washington Bar. He graduated in 2004 from the UW Law School with an LLM in taxation. He is admitted to practice before the U.S. Tax Court as well as Federal District Court. The major focus of his law practice is corporate and LLC law with emphasis on federal tax and ERISA issues. Additionally, his practice includes estate planning for clients with significant tax planning issues. As for today, he's uniquely qualified to speak on our topic because he has advised thousands of entrepreneurs using rollovers as business startup arrangements. Tom is a retired Air Force officer who at one point served as an advisor to the Secretary of the Air Force, and we certainly thank you for your service. Okay, David, I'll turn it over to you now. Great. Uh, thanks for the introductions, Jeff. And uh, to those of you on the call, please... Okay, uh, now looking at the time, we would like to conclude by thanking David, Brian, and Tom. And, <laughs> and we're done. <laughs> um, all right, I, I appreciate the introduction, and I'm, I'm really excited to hear about the response from the tax community. We have hundreds of professionals on the line today, and we're uh, thrilled to have so many of you in attendance. Hope this adds tremendous value for not only you, but for your, your clients as well. The way that we've broken up the presentation, I'm going to give a, a brief overview of uh, the rollovers for business uh, startup arrangement, uh, and then uh, Tom Smith will take some time to share a little bit about some of the operational and structural um, items that professionals who are advising clients uh, that use these structures need to be aware of. And then finally, Brian will 
cover some of the uh, compliance uh, history and then IRS audit issues to be aware of. And then finally, we'll, uh, we'll open up for Q&A with the remaining time uh, that we have. So uh, by way of a little background, uh, as shared uh, in the introduction, my company, Guidant Financial, has helped uh, more than 14,000 business owners across all 50 states and, um, frankly, all walks of life to invest $4 billion into small businesses. Uh, we're extremely proud of the fact that those businesses have created over 80,000 uh, U.S. jobs and are contributing tangible value to the economy. Um, in terms of uh, the problem we'll solve them for, this is very important because today 97% of businesses are considered uh, small. Now, the government defines small as under $50 million in revenue, and from my perspective, that's way too high. But I think the point is still the same. Um, American businesses have been relatively uh, ignored by financial institutions because they're considered administ administratively um, expensive or risky investments. In fact, the data shows that if someone is willing to take the time to fill out an entire SBA loan application and present that to one of the large banks, uh, three-quarters of them are going to get declined. Uh, and even still, if they're one of those that are lucky enough to receive bank financing, uh, they're likely to be undercapitalized. Um, and again, this is based on the definition of small, and it's conceivable that it gets worse as we start to look at more brick-and-mortar um, small businesses. And I define those as, as businesses where to open or to purchase the total capital request was under a million dollars. And as you all know, um, that represents a significant portion of the small business startup and transfer community. So because of the lack of capital, uh, it's forced entrepreneurs to be more resourceful. Um, today, Cash uh, or savings plus credit cards still represent a supermajority of the small businesses that are being opened or funded. Uh, and this is, again, where the total capital request is under a million. Uh, and that's unlikely to change in the near term. There are you know, more standard options like SBA loans and equipment financing that are readily available, but those come with uh, terms and interest, collateral requirements, things that maybe these entrepreneurs are uncomfortable with or potentially even ineligible for. Um, and so we're seeing a significant portion of people that are accessing capital through HELOCs or retirement funds. And this is particularly true uh, for uh, franchising establishments. Now, today we're going to focus on uh, retirement funds. And uh, at a high level, there's three ways that you can use retirement assets to fund a business. Uh, the first is simply to take a taxable distribution. And in that case, uh, the individual could be subject to federal and state taxes plus uh, potentially penalties depending on uh, when they are taking those distributions. The second, and we see this on occasion, people use their 401k uh, and take a loan against it, which uh, can be an option for a very small capital injection, but they are limited uh, to the amount that they can take out. Um, but then there's finally the arrangement that, we, that is called rollover for business startups, or ROBS is really the acronym that we use. And this is where an individual can invest up to 100% of their retirement assets into a small business or franchise, um, without taking a taxable, taxable distribution or getting a loan. Um, ROBS uh, is an arrangement that was made possible through a series of explicit exemptions passed by Congress to encourage investments in small business. Um, although most people are not aware that you can invest your retirement assets outside the stock market, um, we've helped thousands of people do that successfully. And when we talk about ROBS, generally there's two responses. One is that people say, uh, you let people do what with their retirement plans? Uh, or the other is that's amazing, and I can see why entrepreneurs would do this. In fact, uh, a senior executive with a franchising organization told me years ago that Rob's reminded her of home equity lines of credit 20 years ago. Uh, and the community would say, you should never use your house to buy a business. But over the course of the 90s and then even into the 2000s, it became a very common way that people did that. And similarly, when we entered the market in 2003, people often said, you should never let people invest retirement assets into a business, but today it is definitely one of the main ways that people are capitalizing businesses under a million dollars. And it's important that you're all on this call to learn about this because the industry is gaining momentum. Now, um, important to note that uh, there is no analyst that tracks our space. So instead, um, our company has had to use its own data and some public data to estimate the industry's growth. And our best estimates are that it has grown at a compound annual growth rate of 19%. Uh, and we believe that's due to two primary issues. The first is simply market awareness. Um, the small business community has embraced ROBS, and the professionals supporting many of those transactions have helped to raise awareness. Uh, in addition to that, a lot of content has been created um, 
the IRS's published information as well as law firms uh, and even companies like ours. Uh, but the base of potential participants, uh, and I'm sorry, I should move this here. Um, the base of participants has grown, um, and it has grown um, because of the momentum in defined contribution plans, uh, particularly the 401k space. So if you look at the graph here on the right side of the screen, uh, it is simply showing you the amount of assets that are pouring into uh, different types of plans, and the green line being defined contribution. You can see there are more assets being um, deferred since inception. In addition to that, um, on the left-hand side, you'll see that the auto-enrollment feature, which is utilized in many of the 401k plans out there, is encouraging additional investment, and thus more people are saving more dollars over time. And the maturity of that 401k market uh, has created a broader base of potential participants in using ROBS as a viable option. Now, um, before we go into how these things are formed, let me give you an example that is very common. Um, this is just to help illustrate the point. But if you have a retirement plan, you probably invested that in stocks, bonds, or mutual funds. And because I'm in the Pacific Northwest, let's use ROBS as an example. I can use my IRA or 401k to invest in their business um, by sending money to them through my broker. They get to use that to build and grow their empire, and I get shares as collateral, per se, for making that investment. And as Microsoft performs well, the investment grows in value. And the same thing or a similar thing is happening here in a rollover or business startup arrangement, except instead of investing the stock of a publicly traded company, my retirement plan is investing my own, uh, in my own privately held business. And because it's an investment, there's no debt and thus no interest payments due to a bank, which is a huge advantage over the majority of businesses that would uh, typically have a loan or its corresponding overhead. So if you use that same example, this is how uh, ROBS works. Um, step one is a new co corporation is created, and this is going to serve as the business that you, you operate out of. Uh, once that business is formed, it's now considered uh, an employer firm and can, can establish a, a 401k plan as a benefit. So the second step is to create a 401k plan for that business. And then from there, we can help to uh, move those existing retirement assets uh, from one or many places and all are part of it into this new 401k plan. And then the 401k is, uh, makes an investment into the new corporation. It's similar to the example we used a minute ago in Microsoft. The money goes into the new corporation and the 401k gets to use that, or excuse me, the um, 401k becomes a share shareholder and the corporation gets to use that for any necessary uh, or ordinary business expenses. So the question is who's using these? And it's probably not far off from what you would assume. In order for this strategy to work, one needs a minimum of $50,000 in a retirement plan, but on average it's, uh, it's getting closer to $200,000, which means that the person would have to have worked long enough in corporate America, earned enough, and saved enough to do this. So our typical client looks like a 40 to 60 year old who has held a mid to senior management level position within an organization or, or been a highly compensated employee. So they also own a home, are married, have good credit, and so on. Um, and the three primary reasons that we believe people use these is first, they believe it's a better investment for their retirement plan. Instead of investing in stocks or bonds or mutual funds, things that they have limited control over or don't necessarily understand, they're investing in something where they can actually drive uh, long-term value. The second is it is establishing a 401k for their small business, and this is a benefit that not only they want to continue to have for themselves, but also have to and want to make available to their team. And then finally, uh, they believe that their likelihood of success could be higher without debt. So I put together a very brief example to illustrate this, uh, and, and this slide here shows you simply in a $500,000 transaction, whether it was startup or purchase, doesn't really matter. Uh, how the cost of capital plays out over the course of time. So the orange line here shows uh, the interest that you would pay using a variety of financing strategies that are commonly utilized, whereas the blue line would show the total payment. Um, I do want to note something, though, that first is that, as I said earlier, <coughs> ROBS is not a loan. So you see payments there, but those are actually just the cost of forming ROBS and then the ongoing administration fees for the 401k. So it's not apples to apples, but I wanted to show this because the, it shows um, what the cost of the business would be, or at least impacts the cash flow over a period of 10, 20, or 30 years, 10 being the SBA loan, 
we factored a, a securities-based loan or the home equity line of credit over 20, and then the SBA loan, or excuse me, the cash out refi over 30 uh, years. So it's easy to see what those payments could look like um, depending on the term and the rate and so on. So while debt can be a great way to buy or build a business, it does add some expense and puts your clients further away from cash flow break even. Now at this time, I want to administer our first, our first poll. Um, the, uh, again, this is a requirement, as you heard in the introduction, for the, uh, the CPE credit. If you can, please answer yes to confirm your attendance, and then click Submit. What would be, that would be great if you could participate in that. We'll give you just a few seconds to do that. Okay. Now, we want to talk about some of the formative and operational requirements associated with ROBS. And for that, I'm going to pass the baton uh, to Tom Smith. So, Tom, could you take us away? Yes, thank you, David. Uh, I have just a few uh, comments to make about this, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to participate today. Uh, the number one question that accountants ask when they see this structure for the first time is, why the heck is this a, a C corporation instead of an S corporation? Uh, it's just a technical reason. It's a combination of several minor rules combined into one major conclusion that ROB structures must be C corporations to ensure that the stock that is purchased by the 401k plan and the corporation, that stock is called Qualifying Employer Securities, or QES for short, so that that stock uh, becomes qualified and remains quali qualified. So the entire time that the 401k has ownership interest in the corporation, it must remain a C corporation. But which that also means that if you want to convert it to an S corporation later, it can be converted, but due to a uh, federal rule under ERISA called adequate consideration that the stock must be redeemed only at appraised fair market value. I'll point out that this rarely happens for a profitable ROBS corporation just because it's expensive and a little bit complex, uh, but it does happen occasionally. Um, it's often more common when somebody is done with this so they become a serial entrepreneur and move on to another business by selling this business and, and moving on. But uh, it is possible to redeem the stock and turn it into an S corporation at that time. Many folks uh, point out the disadvantages of C corporations uh, because they feel that, that uh, they're told that, that there's the, the evil double taxation. I'll point out that double taxation is uh, really only in play if you're paying dividends. That's the second level of taxation after the first level of corporate taxation. Most of Rob's clients don't pay dividends. They would only normally pay them if they have a large number of passive shareholders uh, that demand some sort of form of compensation for their input. Most are not in that kind of a position, so most don't need to pay dividends. Uh, the other disadvantages of a C corporation, taxation on the sale. If, the, if it's an asset sale instead of a stock sale, you're going to be paying a higher level of tax because it's treated as ordinary income to the corporation. Same with appreciated real property. The tax gain, uh, uh, or the, uh, the gain tax would be at a corporate income tax uh, level instead of, um, uh, instead of a, uh, a capital gain tax level. So on the next slide, uh, we look at uh, compensation and other transfers to clients, often questions that are asked, especially from the accounting world, especially after seeing some cases that came out in 2013 with self-directed IRAs paying compensation to, to uh, clients, and those were deemed to be prohibited transactions. <clears throat> the ROB structure is different because it's operating with qualifying employer security, so it has slightly different rules that apply to it. In a ROB uh, company, the, uh, the corporation must constitute an operating company under the rules, uh, and as part of that, the client not only can be paid, they must be a paid employee putting a significant amount of time into the corporation each year. Uh, however, the IRS, back in their 2008 ROBS memorandum, uh, stated that you cannot use the proceeds from the rollover, from the QES transaction, as the lingo is in the industry, they cannot use that rollover money to pay their compensation. The IRS never said what that meant or explained it any further, but most attorneys who operate in this arena agree that it's a safe interpretation to say that the compensation can only come out of the revenue that the company is earning, not out of the capital that's coming in. Other transfers to clients, 
uh, can the corporation directly loan money to the client? No, that would likely be a prohibited transaction. As David pointed out, the 401k plan can loan money to the client, but the corporation itself should not. As far as di distributions, if there are dividends paid, they must be paid to all the shareholders proportionately to their ownership. In other words, if you have a corporation where 95% of the corporation is owned by the 401k plan and 5% by the client, and you had a $10,000 dividend, then the 401k would get 9,500 of that uh, dividend, and the client would get 500, which in a sense is a very good deal because that money that goes back in as a dividend tends to grow tax deferred in the 401k plan. As far as a return of capital, that's what I meant by buying back the QES stock. If it's redeemed at a later time, it must be done with an appraisal to meet the adequate consideration rule. Next slide, please. Great, and as we're going to the next slide, Tom, I just want to point out to the, those that are listening uh, to the webinar, there is a chat function on the right-hand side. Many of you are using that to throw in questions. Uh, please uh, put your questions in there, and I will try to interject those as we go. And if not, we'll handle those at the very end. But I uh, just wanted to make note to the audience. So go ahead, Tom. Thanks, David. Uh, some of the other transfers that people often ask about, is it okay to pay yourself a paycheck? Yes. As I said, it's a requirement, actually, for the client to be a paid employee. So there must be at least some list of things that must be okay for money to transfer from the client to the corporation or from the corporation to the client without being uh, seen as inappropriate or a prohibited transaction. Examples of those would be things like your normal weekly paycheck or an expense account reimbursement, things that would have a normal commercial paper trail and be a normal business transaction uh, with no personal use involved. So in the next bullet there, I talk about the personal use is not okay. Uh, there was a client who actually used his entire rollover to buy a personal yacht instead of buying his business. Um, there was another client who did a Maserati instead of a business or taking the family to Disney World with a corporate credit card. Those things, of course, are common sense. They're inappropriate in any business, but they could be penalized more heavily in a prohibited transaction in a ROP structure. Also, conflicts of interest. It's not allowed to have conflicts of interest between the ROB structure and other businesses or commercial property that the client or the other uh, family members called disqualified persons would have a financial interest in. Uh, an example was a case in 2006 where there was an interaction between this type of structure and a, uh, an LLC that owned the real estate where the, um, where the uh, real estate was in this LLC and they leased it back to the corporation, but the LLC was owned by family members. That's considered inappropriate as a conflict of interest in, in this type of thing. So that's all I have. I'm looking forward to your questions in a few minutes. My contact info is on the next slide and it'll be in the packet that's mailed out to you later. Feel free to contact me if you have other questions probably easiest to get a hold of me initially by email. Back to you, David. Great. Great. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate that. Um, and actually, Tom, I believe we have one more for you. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. I, uh, I had that uh, a little out of order there. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the guarantee rule. Uh, guarantee rule is one of the prohibited transactions. Ironically, it doesn't say guarantee anywhere in the prohibited transaction statute. This is one that has been summarized in case law and uh, by actual practice by the IRS. It is okay if the client or their corporation guarantees a loan or they provide uh, collateral uh, in, uh, in a variety of contracts. Uh, so examples that are okay, uh, if the borrower's corporation, the client personally guarantees in his own name, that's okay. If the borrower is a corporation, it can also pledge its assets as collateral, that's also okay, but it's not okay if in my first example in the next uh, major bullet there, it says all the stock of the corporation is collateral for this loan. Well, all the stock would include the stock that is owned by the 401k. That would mean the 401k is performing a guarantee. That would be a prohibited transaction. Also, if it says something to the effect of all the shareholders of the corporation shall guarantee payments under this agreement, uh, you should remember that the 401k again is a shareholder, and that would mean that that would be a violation. Uh, so if there is such a violation built into a contract, the typical way to resolve that is I just work with the client to get both parties to agree that the 401k is waived as a guarantor and instead the client 
picks up a personal guarantee instead. That's very common. Most banks, most other entities that want to do business with a client will want to sign that kind of addendum so they continue to do business with the client and they get their business. Yep. So I think that's the last one. Is that correct, David? Yeah, that is, that is correct. But Tom, can you maybe just expand on this point just a little bit further? Because one thing that we've seen uh, here within our organization is that approximately half of the individuals that we work with are using multiple forms of financing. So there's oftentimes um, most common being a 401k and an SBA loan. So could you just talk briefly using that example, how, how to drive this point home a little bit further because it's a pretty common occurrence. Well, the 401k loan uh, is something that Guidant would write into the plan documents authorizing the client to use a 401k as a source of money uh, to help and usually that would be used to tide them over during the dry spell when they're starting up a business before they have enough revenue to pay themselves any kind of compensation. Uh, the rule is that it can be a maximum of half of their um, value of the 401k or $50,000, whichever is less, is the amount that they could borrow from that. And that would be on a formal promissory note paid back over time to directly to the 401k plan uh, with interest and they'd use the IRS approved interest rate for that. The, with an SBA loan, SBA loans ironically have a built-in prohibited transaction because of a rule that says that any 20% or more shareholder of the corporation must guarantee the loan. Well, of course, in most ROB structures, the 401k owns well over half, so far more than 20%. But through a process that the SBA agreed to back in 2005, there's an addendum process or a waiver process that if the client goes through this one or two day waiver process, then they get the guarantee or the 20% rule waived in favor of the client being the guarantor instead. And this is a process that when I have a client who's doing an SBA loan, I send them back to Guidant because Guidant has administrative staff who will perform that waiver process through the SBA lender totally free of charge. Uh, and it's very routine so far in the 12 years that the SBA has been granting waivers. They've done it 100% of the time for guiding clients. It's very routine, just takes one or two extra days in the process. Yep. It, there was a question that came in from one of the participants that I think uh, would be helpful to interject here that I would love to have you just take a few minutes to, to talk about. The question is, if the corporation rents real estate from the client, what are the tax consequences? There are severe tax consequences because that disqualifies the plan. Uh, the corporation is not allowed to rent real estate from the client or other disqualified persons who are close relatives. It would be normally disqualified persons would include the spouse plus parents, grandparents, children, grandchildren, son-in-law, daughter-in-law. Uh, so they cannot rent from the client. The real estate, if it's owned and it's associated with this ROBS structure, it must be either owned by the ROBS corporation or by a subsidiary of the ROBS corporation. Uh, it cannot be owned by the client and leased back. And that's one of the common accounting questions that I get because that technique is used very often whenever there's a C corporation interacting with real estate. That's one of the most common accounting techniques to use so that you avoid the uh, real estate being in a taxable, uh, higher taxable situation. It just happens to be illegal in this particular structure due to that case that I talked about back in 2006. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. So at this point, uh, we need to go ahead and do our second uh, poll. So uh, you'll see the poll up here on the right-hand side of your screen here. Please answer yes to confirm your attendance and then uh, click submit. Again, this is for the CTE credit. Um, I've seen, I can see that that has now launched, so please go ahead and respond to that. Um, and with that, I want to turn this over to Brian McManus, uh, who has represented many uh, Rob's customers in what we consider a rare circumstance that the Rob's audit is, uh, needs some uh, defense. So, Brian, could you uh, kick us off with a compliance history and uh, IRS audit? Sure. Uh, thanks very much, David. And it's absolutely a pleasure to be speaking with this group today. I'm Brian McManus. I'm a tax controversy partner at Latham & Watkins. And as a tax controversy lawyer, part of my job is to represent companies being audited by the IRS. I also represent companies and individuals in um, federal tax litigation and sometimes even state tax matters. Um, by way of background, I've represented Guidant Financial and uh, a number of their clients uh, who have been audited 
over the years. I should say at the outset that um, Guidant has had um, you know thousands of uh, businesses as clients, and so. Um, even though I've been involved in uh, quite a few audits on behalf of guidance clients over the years, uh, statistically those numbers are about right. Um, so is signing up and uh, undertaking a, uh, a ROBS uh, transaction and administering a ROBS 401k plan is not signing up for an IRS audit. Um, there was a period, and we'll talk about this, in uh, 2009, 10, 11, when the IRS launched a research project uh, to become more familiar and more experienced with examining uh, 401k plans with Rob's features. As, as part of that project, um, uh, a number of guidance clients, still a very small percentage, were, were selected for audit, and uh, I represented them through those processes. Um, I've also represented competitors of guidance, so my experience is not just uh, in isolation um, there. So, um, so my, my background here and, and my observations are really through my personal experiences as, as lawyers for companies that were um, dealing with the IRS through the examination process. Um, I should also say, uh, just like Tom is a lawyer, and, and now I'm going to convince you that I'm a lawyer um, by saying that these are just my personal opinions and I'm speaking in generalities. Um, so this is not legal advice to anybody. Um, but uh, hopefully, now that you're all convinced um, that I am a lawyer because I've got those caveats, I'm going to talk about uh, the compliance history and, and what I've observed. Um, so first, I think it's important to give you the headline point, which is that um, for more than a decade now, the IRS has carefully scrutinized Rob's arrangements. Um, they issued a memo in October of 2008 um, that I've cited here. Uh, it's called Guidelines Regarding Rollovers as Business Startups, or ROBS. Um, that's an internal IRS memo. It's essentially the IRS talking to itself about the issues that um, the IRS at that time had observed uh, with regard to these types of arrangements. Um, that memo is still publicly available. You can find it on the IRS website. Um, it's still valid in terms of reflecting what the IRS's positions are on some of these issues. Although, in my experience, the IRS's uh, concerns uh, about Rob's arrangements have been tempered over time as they become more familiar uh, with these types of arrangements and as they've had more experience in examining them. Um, as I mentioned, um, the IRS engaged in a research project in uh, uh, 09. It was actually, there's a, there's a quick typo on the slide here. It was, uh, it was, I think it was December of 08 through September of 09 um, that the Employee Plans Compliance Unit um, engaged in this research project. And basically what that involved was going out and auditing a number of uh, 401k plans with Rob's features and trying to figure out from the IRS perspective what they thought about them. Um, the IRS published some of its conclusions in a newsletter, um, but essentially the, the, the sort of big takeaway there from that project for the IRS was after looking at a number of 401k plans with Rob's features, they concluded as they had very preliminarily in the 2008 memo that the structure of uh, a Rob's arrangement in and of itself complies with the tax laws. Um, what they found, however, was that, you know, the devil was in the details and that uh, in a number of plans they said that they examined, um, they found operational deficiencies uh, by the plan and, and various sort of internal problems. Um, in my experience, that was not what occurred in the audits that I was involved in. Um, in the audits that I was involved in, uh, they were almost all no change. Um, they almost all went very smoothly. Uh, there were a few audits that I were involved in um, where the companies had done things subsequent to the rollover transaction that they probably shouldn't have done. Um, and those issues are not Rob's issues. Those issues are really just general corporate issues. Uh, and those issues are really uh, indicative of the more complex 
issues that arise whenever you have a 401k plan. Um, so the issues that I observed through the IRS examination process on behalf of a number of clients were not at all related to the rollover or the ROBS issue itself, um, but really they were the general issues of maintaining a 401k plan generally. And so I'll talk about some of the um, issues that the IRS um, spotted um, during that process. Um, the takeaway here is that you know the IRS has really not historically taken any position at all that robs transactions and the overall structure violates the tax rules. Um, on the other hand, they've absolutely cautioned that um, it's it's easy to run afoul of the tax rules if you don't know what you're doing, um, which in my experience means that uh, it's really critical that when a ROBS structure is put in place, the uh, advisors who are advising on the structure understand the details, understand the law, and, um, and that it's a reputable uh, company that's arranging the structure and that uh, there are lawyers involved and that the CPAs involved understand the rules and that um, the client is educated because the client is adopting a structure that uh, and any plan that is going to require you know routine maintenance and uh, they're entering into a fairly complicated system of tax laws and so they need to understand how to do that it's not um, you know there are thousands and tens of thousands of companies that have successfully done this so this is not impossible to do by any stretch but it's important that um, clients have a level of sophistication and training and understanding so that they don't run afoul of the tax laws because, um, as Tom mentioned, the consequences can be um, fairly significant. It's, it's also worth noting, and I have a couple of cases that are cited at the end of this slide, um, that first, there have been no ROBS 401k decisions in the courts where the merits of a ROBS 401k transaction were challenged. So the reason why that is is because the IRS has not, it requires, you know, the, the courts are an adversarial process. You have to have one side making an argument that it doesn't work and the other side saying it works, um, and then the court's making a decision. Um, the reason why there are no cases is because the IRS has not taken the position that a ROBS 401k transaction um, doesn't work from a structural perspective. Um, they have, however, taken that position in the context of IRAs. Um, IRAs are, are fundamentally different. Uh, the rules apply differently. And so um, uh, these cases, while they're worth understanding, absolutely, um, and there are lessons to be drawn from those cases, um, they're really not in my view, applicable to 401k structures because the laws that those cases were interpreting um, do not include some of the exceptions that are relied upon um, in the context of 401k transactions. So those are all IRA cases, Thyssen, Ellis, and Peak. They're not, they're not 401k cases. Um, let's go to the next slide. And I'm going to talk about some of the problems that uh, I personally observed and also that the IRS has identified. Um, as I mentioned before, these issues uh, that have come up on IRS examinations are really operational issues, and they're unrelated to the rollover transaction itself. So these are the more common issues that I've observed in my practice, and, and also the IRS, as I said, has, has identified these. So one of the biggest problems that I've seen is incorrect information reporting um, by the prior custodians. And so what happens there is that um, it, it, although the transaction is intended to be a trustee to trustee uh, custodian custodian rollover, um, they're not reported that way on a 1099 that the prior custodian issued to um, the uh, individual account holder. And so what ends up happening is that um, when the IRS uh, receives the individual's tax return and the income is not reported or is not reported as having been rolled over, 
um, which is more often the problem where it's completely omitted from the return itself, the IRS sends a letter to the taxpayer and says, um, hey, we got a 1099 showing that you received a distribution and it's not on your tax return, please explain. Often in the cases that I've seen, uh, either those letters uh, uh, you know, are not answered by the taxpayer or when they are, the IRS is just completely flummoxed because it goes to a technician in the service center who has no idea what um, the uh, person is saying when they respond and start talking about Rob's transactions. And so I've seen a number of these uh, cases sort of evolve into um, a, you know, a protracted discussion with uh, the IRS. Um, I, in all of the cases that I've been involved in, they were successfully resolved in favor of the taxpayer, but sometimes uh, if the issue is screwed up by the prior account custodian, um, it, it takes a little bit of work to, uh, to resolve that. Um, in my experience, there's also been uh, some uh, failure to file issues of 5500s and that sort of thing. That's a um, routine issue. A uh, 5500 is filed by the plan. That's essentially the plan's tax return. It's the trustee of the plan that has the obligation to file the 5500. And so when, and, uh, and or the company, which is usually the same thing, effectively. Um, so if the 5500 is not filed by the plan, that, or on behalf of the plan, then um, the IRS may note that, and um, that can be a compliance problem. Um, that's not just a ROBS issue, it's a 401k plan issue very generally. Um, I've also seen, and the IRS has also found, prohibited transactions involving the rollover transaction itself. And there, you know, there are a couple of things that can go awry when you're actually uh, rolling over the funds. One is that um, the money does not end up with the plan. So, in other words, um, you know, the uh, rather than putting the money, you know, from one uh, 401k plan or IRA into the company's 401k plan, the money ends up in the person's bank account or the money goes directly to the company or the actual mechanics of the transaction gets screwed up in some way. Um, usually, substance over form covers that in that at the end of the day, if the company has the money itself and the plan owns the shares of the company, then if there is a misstep in how the cash moved around from a mechanical perspective, the IRS has, in my experience, been okay with that. Um, but bigger issues come up if, for example, the money ends up in the individual's checking account for a protracted period of time, and some of it gets actually spent. So, um, you know, if the money essentially leaks out of the system and the person uses that money for personal purposes, then that can be certainly a prohibited transaction. Um, there are obviously lots of opportunities for other prohibited transactions. Again, this is not a Rob's arrangement issue. This is just a general 401k issue, particularly when you're having folks who are not experienced with dealing with a complex uh, regulatory and tax environment trying to operate these kinds of plans. And that's where sort of the experience of the advisors comes in. That's where I've seen, in my experience, you know, Guidant and the professional advisory firms that do this sort of thing every day, um, I think, make a, uh, make a difference there. Um, Another issue that I've seen come up, uh, which is one that you really need to caution uh, your clients about or anybody thinking about um, entering into this kind of an arrangement is they really understand, need to understand that a, a Rob 401k plan needs to be a genuine employee benefit that's offered for you know, the benefit of all of the employees of the company. And so I sort of call this issue the, the secret 401k plan issue. And, and sometimes, no matter how well you educate someone, um, you just can't get that notion past them where they say, well, of course, I'm going to own the company, and this is my 401k plan, and I didn't really want to create an employee benefit uh, for all of these other employees, particularly if they're going to be, you know, 
full time, but you know, minimum wage workers uh, who are not otherwise, you know, particularly invested in the business. And so really it's important that anybody contemplating this kind of an arrangement understand that this is a true 401k plan and it has to be operated that way. And, and nothing will really upset the IRS more than finding out that the plan was essentially operated in secret and that the employees weren't offered an opportunity to participate. Uh, because that is really what the sort of the ultimate audit and guardianship function is of TEGE and also the DOL. It's to protect employees. And so, um, so it's really important that that issue uh, be dealt with properly and that folks understand it. And again, this is not a, an issue that is uh, unique to Rob's. It's just a, a, a issue that may be unique to entrepreneurs who have not previously operated in this environment. Um, there are also sort of issues with eligibility. Um, there can be valuation issues, uh, particularly if after the, um, after the transaction is entered into, if subsequent transactions um, occur with the company itself, uh, if additional stock, um, want, you know, if the company wants to issue additional stock to other folks, um, that's when valuation issues become important because, you know, the plan is the owner at that point, and the trustees of the plan have fiduciary duties to the participants of the plan, and that sort of legal fiction becomes very difficult to grasp sometimes for non-lawyers and non-accountants who don't work in this field when you have someone who's essentially wearing a whole bunch of hats. Um, and they're thinking, well, it's my company. Well, no, it's the plan's company. Uh, well, I am the plan. Well, no, you're not really the plan. Um, and so all of those sort of legal fictions of the plan, the trustee, the owner, the director, the president, the employee, all having separate legal identities, but having sort of ultimately being one single person um, becomes a little complicated. Uh, and it's important that uh, folks understand the distinctions and the different hats they'll wear. And this is an issue that um, the IRS certainly looks at. Um, and then the final issue is just record keeping. Um, record keeping for 401k plans is generally complicated. Um, it's, not, it's not impossible, it's intended so that um, folks, you know, who operate small businesses can uh, offer these kinds of employee benefits and certainly the IRS and the DOL and Congress dearly want to encourage um, small businesses to offer these kinds of benefits. It's not a sort of elite club of the Fortune 500 that can offer a 401k plan, but unfortunately the IRS and Treasury being the way they are along with the DOL the record keeping is complicated. And so um, that's another issue where um, folks tend to get themselves into trouble. Um, it, you know, the issues that come up here are generally simple issues. And, uh, you know, it does not mean the end of the 401k plan. Sometimes it's just a, a little slap on the wrist or a reminder by the IRS or the DOL that they need to do something better. Um, but certainly if it rises to, you know, some significant level, it could put the overall qualification of the plan itself at risk. And so in that way, I would uh, really caution folks that were thinking about doing one of these transactions um, to not try to do all of the record keeping themselves. It, the record keeping process, because of all the testing requirements, is something that really needs to be handled by a um, professional. So David, if we could go to the next slide. Sure, and I just want to remind um, all of the professionals that are listening in that if you get your final questions in, that would be great. We've got about 10 minutes until we close, so we'll move to Q&A in just a few minutes. Um, yep, sure. Thanks, David. Um, and I'm going to just sort of breeze quickly through this slide so that we can get to the Q&A. Um, as I mentioned, the IRS and TEGE now have really more than a decade of enforcement experience uh, and activity out here. Um, nevertheless, sort of outside TEGE, so when these issues come up in uh, e examinations of the company itself or the individual, there's still a learning curve, in my experience, um, at the IRS. And so if you ever find yourself representing a uh, company 
or an individual in an audit uh, where these issues arise. Um, um, one strategy that I've found to be very effective is to actually encourage um, the agent, if questions start coming up, to speak with someone in TEGE. Um, that's the Tax Exempt Government Entities Division of the IRS. So they're the group that audits 401k plans. Um, I would encourage the agent to go reach out to their colleagues um, because the agents in TEGE uh, in the employee plan group are trained on these issues. They understand them. But Outside that group, um, less uh, is known about them, so uh, I've seen some agents get a little bit confused. Um, as I've mentioned, to my knowledge, um, the IRS has never challenged the overall structure of a 401k arrangement. I've been involved in you know, many exams. They've certainly had every opportunity to do that, and they've never done it. Um, the issues are routine compliance problems. And, and as I said, I've personally observed, you know, a lot of no changes. Again, these are not, um, you know, abnormal audit rates. Uh, these are just, uh, you know, the fact that um, Guidant and, uh, you know, other companies like Guidant have, you know, tens of thousands of these plans. So the IRS has picked up, you know, a number of them through the audit process. Um, the, by the way, as an aside, the, the audit rate for plans are a little bit higher um, just generally than for companies, and, and part of that is that um, the IRS is sort of acting in a supervisory capacity to protect pension plans generally, essentially on behalf of the employees. So, so they tend to audit plans at a little bit of a higher rate. Um, and then as I've mentioned, there have been um, several court cases actually involving 401k arrangements. Um, I've been involved in a number of them. Um, they have arisen exclusively in the context of 1099-R reporting. And how those have come about is um, folks have not responded to notices uh, by the IRS regarding the rollovers, uh, or when they did, um, there was miscommunication between the IRS and them about what actually happened. And so the IRS computer system just issues these deficiency notices, uh, which essentially forces taxpayers into the tax court to have the issues resolved. Um, by many, I'm saying there's probably been about 10 um, that I'm familiar with. Um, in, in all of those cases, uh, the IRS lawyers resolve those cases uh, completely favorably on behalf of the taxpayers. So um, I take some comfort in that uh, fact in knowing that um, the IRS has looked at these, the lawyers have looked at these, and they haven't pursued um, these uh, alternative arguments that we've seen them make in the IRA cases. So, so that's my uh, report, and um, I'm happy to take any questions and, and turn it back to David at this point. Great. Well, we've only got a few minutes left. I should, I should acknowledge, though, that um, you know, uh, in the rare circumstance that a client is audited and this Rob's arrangement is uh, part of that uh, process, um, many of the organizations out there, including ours, retain or pay for representation to help the client go through um, that process. So um, as Brian said, um, just, I think he did a good job of spelling out sort of what that process looks like. That being said, um, we do have to hold our third poll in terms of uh, your participation in this event. So before we move into the q and I'd like to just uh, launch the poll here on the right-hand side. Please go ahead and uh, take that. Um, wait for one second. And while we're doing that, actually, Tom, maybe I could just turn uh, the mic over to you for just one minute. Uh, if you could just talk quickly about what are some of the misconceptions that accountants often have about Rob structures, that would be maybe a good place to jump in. Uh, there are several. Uh, among them are that this should have been an S corporation, as I mentioned earlier. And then one of the questions that we had, can the real estate be owned by the client and leased back? That's a very common misconception. Also, there are misconceptions about pay because I often get questions about the very cases that Brian was just talking about, particularly Peak and Ellis. We get a lot of questions about why is what my client is doing okay, but it wasn't okay in Peak and Ellis. And I think Brian distinguished those cases very clearly as not being Rob structures, and therefore the rules apply uh, differently, as Brian said. So those are the most common. Um, questions I get from accountants, and, and all three of those areas are very common. I get lots of those questions over and over again. Great. And, you know, one other thing, maybe while you're, you 
We've got the, the mic here. Maybe you could talk a little bit about business failure. There's a couple questions in here around what are the implications of a, a failure in the event that that occurs? If the, uh, if the business overall fails, uh, then, if, then basically you, you, you reverse the QES transaction. I'm, I'm here to help clients on the tail end of their process as well as at the beginning and throughout the life cycle as an outside counsel. But typically if somebody ends up financially failing, then uh, at the end of the process they would end up selling off or liquidating whatever assets that they have left, converting things to cash, paying off whatever liabilities remain, and then if there's any cash back, then it goes back to the shareholders in the same percentages that are owned on the stock ledger. In other words, in the example I gave before, if it's 95% owned by the 401k, then the 401k would get 95% of the net proceeds and the client would get the other 5%. The part that goes into the 401k would then go back into an IRA in that client's uh, name, and then the entire process would be dissolved. But getting back to a couple of the related questions that I saw very briefly uh, for failure, what if the client fails to pay back the 401k plan uh, loan, then that turns into a taxable distribution. Uh, if you are in default on payments that at a certain point, that it turns into a taxable distribution. If the client is under 59 and a half, then there's also a 10% penalty. As far as uh, failing to pay on an SBA loan, as I mentioned earlier, that the SBA will grant a waiver to their 20% rule, making the client the guarantor on the loan. So if they default, then the client's other assets could be on the chopping block. So it's very important that clients not default on SBA loans because not only uh, if they are losing their 401k in a failure, they could also be losing their savings that are not in retirement plans or other assets that they have outside of the ROB structure. So it's very important that they keep in both of those areas that they uh, enter into those agreements with the intent of making sure that they're paying those things off. Well, because of the limited time, I want to just um, help to, to close this up here. A couple things that I'd just like to note. First, um, you know, in summary, I would say that these are legitimate arrangements that help tens of thousands of entrepreneurs open up businesses, but they are, um, they are complex, um, and that's why it's important that your clients work with an experienced professional and why I think it's important that uh, each of you showed up here uh, and commend you for doing so. Um, you know, we, we work with tens of thousands of clients across the country and have partnered with uh, Paychex uh, because they are world class in terms of payroll and HR su uh, support for small businesses. Collectively, you know, we're working towards helping more people get into business and reduce friction in operating one so that they have a higher likelihood of succeeding. Um, so appreciate uh, us being able to participate. In terms of next steps, um, and I'll turn this back to our host, um, I just wanted to make you aware of, and there's a URL that's flashing up on the screen. It's tinyurl.com forward slash guidant robs. Uh, we created a special report a few years back that highlights many of the structural and operational issues that have been addressed um, by this presentation and some of the philosophy behind um, not only what those issues are, but how a client can uh, help put themselves in their best position possible. And I would encourage you, if you're interested in learning more about robs, if you want to go one layer deeper um, to, to go ahead and uh, download that report. In addition, questions were asked about could you um, download the slides or would the recording be made available? Um, you can download the slides that should be made available relatively quickly, and I know that um, you'll receive some correspondence after that on um, how you can continue education there. And with that, uh, I appreciate um, both Tom and Brian being part of this webinar with us, and I want to go ahead and pass uh, the baton back to uh, David, Brian, and Tom, and Guidant Financial for lending your expertise regarding this topic. And we would like to thank all of you listening in for your participation today. Right again, we hope you found value in today's session. Thank you very much for your participation, and we hope to see you at future events.